this is a show that I put together for the Indie Junction um, meet uh, back a little while, but well, that was last year. Yeah. And that was a fabulous convention. I was so glad our group was able to make it there. And it was really nice to be back in a train show after a year or two off from that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So also what was neat about it was I did this, besides doing this presentation there, my book came out while I was giving the presentation and everybody got notifications on their phone from Kambach <laughs> that it was on the way. And everybody was coming up to me and saying who had bought it and was saying how excited they were to be able to get it. And I was excited to finally see it in print. The way this book worked was um, Jeff Wilson at the books division came to me and said, hey, uh, would you like to uh, co-author a book with Cody on freight car loads? And I said, well, let's talk about it. And then um, the more we talked about it, the more it, it became clear that I was going to be the author of the book. <laughs> and that was okay because it was COVID and I really didn't have anywhere to go or anything to do. So um, what better way than to spend it going through archives and looking at cool photos? I probably looked at 10,000 images for, wow. in order to cull it down to this book. What's neat about it is it's got the... I got the best out of the Kambach Library in Waukesha. I also got the um, the Ingalls collection, freight car photos, both um, John and his father took lots of photos of freight cars in the 60s in the Detroit and Southern Michigan area. And a lot of those made it into the book. Nice. And um, then I use the other archives. I live in Racine, Wisconsin, and we have the J.I. Case archives here. And I got to go through that. And I went to the Historical Construction Equipment Association archives in Bowling Green, Ohio. And, um, oh, the there were so many archives. I went to Chicago Northwestern, Milwaukee Road archives. So there's a lot of neat stuff in here, as well as the Wisconsin State Historical Society and um, and then all the um, publicity photos that came out. Okay, so that's what the book looks like. Let's, but I'm not going to go through the book. I'm just going to talk, kind of talk about other stuff related to freight car loads. Okay. So freight car loads, the way I, I learned about them was back as a kid with Tyco trains. And it was part of the fun of having a model train. You could load the flat cars and load your scraps in your gondola. It's, it's still fun to do that. Of course, and Lionel always had the um, the open load cars, everything from the giraffe car to the firing missile car. But they also had the prototype loads as well. They actually built this Alice Chalmers well hole flat car that carried condensers for nuclear plants. And that's a prototype car. Um, when I think of open prototype open loads, I think of loads like this. Here's a bunch of self-propelled um, combines coming out of Massey Harris in Toronto, June 1956. Uh, to see loads like this and be, be able to understand how they're loaded and secured was my goal. So I started looking for photos of um, open loads to try and figure out how to um, load them in a prototype way. But the more I searched for photos, the harder it was to find good ones. I could always find good shots of a locomotive and then right behind it often was a flat car that was loaded, but there wasn't enough detail to be able to see it. Or you had a photographer who took a picture of the wrong car. <laughs> So then I got into the Historical Construction Equipment Association. Um, I've been a member of these with these guys for probably 20 years. And basically, you know how you have people who collect old cars or old tractors? These guys collect old construction equipment and they restore it and then they take it to one of their conventions, which is basically a giant sandbox. And over the weekend, they move all the dirt from one side to the other side and then on Sunday, they move it all back and you get to 
watch this and read their magazine, which has um, history of these machines, but also it helps me understand what type of machine was on a flat car in what era. And often they have pictures of the machines loaded up on railroad cars. Okay, so here's the magazine. You get to see all kinds of interesting things. Like for example, this Bantam shovel um, mounted on a army half track. And that was a popular thing back in the 1950s. Hmm. And they left Waverly, Iowa. Um, the plant was served by an electric interurban and they left on flat cars like that. The other thing I used was the AAR's Rules for Governing the Loading of Commodities on Open Top Cars. You can still find these online or you can um, buy one at a train show or from a dealer, but these are really, really useful because they have the drawings that show you how to build, how, how to build your flat car load. So for example, this drawing is four and six wheel motor graders with pneumatic tires loaded lengthwise on flat cars. And how does that translate into HO? Well, there's the blocking, there's the grader and the flat car. Um, notice the, I just grabbed this off the internet, but notice the modeler is using an Illinois terminal flat car because Illinois terminal served the um, Caterpillar plant. And there it is, loaded up. Um, now it just needs the tie downs and it's ready to go. So this loading, when I worked on the railroad, I used to work for Chicago Northwestern. On the first day, they said, the safety rules are written in blood. <laughs> well, yeah. it's true. Um, here, the loading rules <laughs> are written in uh, physics, I guess you could say. <laughs> Here's a derailed link belt speed crane and a load of John Deere tractors tangled up in a wreck and they don't look much the worse for wear there. Uh, under better conditions, let's see what one of those uh, cranes looks like. Here we see uh, Bessemer Railroad switching out the Erie, Pennsylvania plant of the Bessemer Erie, and that's a 22B um, crane and shovel. It's got a shovel boom on there too, um, loaded up on the flat. So before I started writing the book, I thought I better look at what other people have written and put it and get an understanding before I go out and see what I want to contribute. Well, there's this set, I think it's five or six volumes called Open Top Loads. And these are great. These are all photographs of just an unbelievable number of open loads. The problem is, there's almost no um, information going with it and little interpretation and no history of what was going on when. Then I got into the um, Ingalls collection. Here's an example of that. These are <clears throat> brand new Massey Ferguson tractors heading out of Detroit. And then uh, I was in a Zoom group of guys in Iowa and, uh, and Michigan, Ron Christensen, if you know him. Um, and they, I asked, hey, who's got open load pictures? And um, they started sending me these photos. And the result was I, I, I budgeted from July 1st to September 1st to get this thing done. And that's how it happened. So let's talk about how it was broken up into chapters. I used the open load AAR book as like, I used their chapters, uh, chapter headings as my chapter headings. So we talk about loading um, steel, all kinds of steel products, things like pipe. I tried to find photos that would show like action, you know, not just, the roster shot, but showing how the railroad actually works. Here's some pipe up in Alberta. The other shot was in Texas. Then I met a um, 
an inspector for the um, FRA. And his job is to inspect open loads. He just lives in the same county as I do. And uh, at the NMRA meetings, everybody would say, oh, you got to go meet so-and-so. He's He does an open loads clinic. So he shared his work photos with me. It's his job to drive around the yards in Chicago and inspect these loads and take photos of them. Yeah. Dream job. Yeah. Then I used my own photos uh, around the Milwaukee area and what I could find in archives. So here's an open load. Let's start with this one. This is a scrap load. I took this as a 12 year old back in the 70s. This is this is probably an illegal load because some of the scrap is loaded so high, it's above the line, uh, the car line, the top car edge. So it could fall out. But this load was just moving a short distance, less than a mile from the JI case plant to the scrapyard. Hmm. There's lots of neat pictures you can find online. Unfortunately, I couldn't use this one in the book because it belongs to Life Magazine, but it shows a guy in 1946 riding in a load of scrap metal. <laughs> Do not try this at home. Right. <laughs> that stuff shifts around in there. And but he doesn't, he looks like he's king of the road, not a care in the world. Yeah. So here's my interpretation. I uh, um, built the load in a nice. or emergency gun. There's also the, the Kambach collection. This is a view that Al Kambach himself took of auto frames leaving Milwaukee. They don't do it like that anymore. No. And they still, here's a, a more updated version. This is in Ontario, or, or no, Quebec. And um, this is how they ship them now on trailer train cars, flat, stacked up. More steel products. Here, they just drop the steel coils in the gun like that. I don't even think they're sitting on pieces of wood. And it's <laughs> like they kind of got banged around a little bit in there. But usually this is not how coil steel moves. Yeah, I live in Gary. We see a lot of coil steel. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and here's some big plate steel. And we see uh, those loaded, too. Yep. Loaded diagonally. This kind of steel, um, I would see it coming up to um, South Milwaukee, where the Bucyrus Erie plant would um, unload it, and they would cut it and make um, big shovels and cranes with it. Those are parked on sightings around here all over the place. Oh, neat. And this is in a, um, in Quebec. These are um, al Alcan aluminum ingots heading for export. Uh, Canadian National has lots of flat cars that are customized for um, specific shippers and specific loads. And here's an example of that. Here's coiled wire from a wire mill. And here's my model that I built for the, the book showing co wire coils in a gun. Mm -hmm. Also some, um, some of Brian Fedorf's, I think he lives in Michigan, uh, his um, street sweepers. I custom made decals for those and um, loaded them in a prototype manner. Yeah, they look great. Yeah, thank you. Okay, the next chapter is farm machinery and heavy equipment. So there's a couple Ford combines about 1962 in the Detroit area. Hmm. And some GI case gasoline tractors being unloaded. And then in the upper right, we see the um, AAR diagram for loading a steam threshing on a flat car. So I go through tractors. Tractors don't just travel like open. They also travel broken down and put in boxes. Here we see um, the Grand Trunk Western Car Ferry at Milwaukee being loaded with case products in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. 
This is the J.I. Case factory in Racine, or was. It's now an empty field, but this is how they loaded the early gasoline tractors, oh, around 1920. Hmm. Notice the wheels are steel, and they just put blocking around the steel wheel. This nice. is also at Racine. Um, these are threshers. This is in the Milwaukee Road Yard, and some gasoline tractors as well. This is the only photo I've ever seen of a boxcar with Fox trucks on it. Huh. But we can, you can look closely, you can see how, again, they put blocking around that steel wheel. When pneumatic tires came into use in the 1930s, then they had to change how they did it. Um, J.I. Case actually well, not J.I. Case the man, but the workers at the company came up with the way of um, securing these loads, and it was then adopted by the AAR. Yeah. And it uses wooden blocks and steel um, steel wire. Here's a close-up of how that looks. Um, the wooden blocks go around the tire. Um, that's to keep the tire from abrasion and damage and movement while traveling on the flat car. And then the wires go through the stake pocket, loop around usually the axle or um, a cutout in the tire. And then they put a, um, you either put a crowbar or um, a two by four, and then you crank on the two wires and tighten them up. And that's how the load is secured. Then in the 60s, when trailer train came along, there were the it was called the Brandon tie down system, and that's still in use today. And that has a channel with um, tracks in it and chains, and then it's tightened up and it chains the tractor to the car directly. There's no waste, and the chains stay with the car. This is an example of Chicago Northwestern taking two obsolete 40 foot flat cars, draw barring them together, and billing it as a single load. The cars are lettered A and B. So this was to make some use of their obsolete equipment when um, 89 foot flats weren't available. <clears throat> so J.I. Case Company then, as well as all the other tractor manufacturers, switched over to the OTTX flat cars. These have the channels and the tie downs in them, but J.I. Case wanted to be sure. So the, on the ground there, that's my old conductor friend, George Conrad. He provided these photos. Um, he was a conductor on the job this day in Racine. And what was happening was the J.I. Case engineers, the railroad engineers, and um, trailer train executives were there. They loaded up a bunch of um, trailer train flat cars, uh, the way they're supposed to be loaded, with the chains and the case tractors. And then they took them over to the yard and then they started kicking these cuts of cars into um, six gondolas that had their handbrake set. And they did it at two miles per hour, four, six, eight, all the way up to 12 miles per hour. Um, George laughed when he told me the, the, everything passed, but they used Milwaukee Road gondolas. <laughs> they got them from the, the, in the Chicago Northwestern Yard. So this is how they still ship them today. This is a view from the 70s. Um, this is a big load, I think five cars, uh, four tractors each. Um, this In the late 70s, this is how they were knocking them out of um, the J.I. Case plant because um, Canada had um, some kind of tax incentive for farmers. So all these tractors are headed to Canada. Here's a view from just a few years ago. I think this load is going to Romania. And now they're loaded on the CP. This is how they load them in the former Milwaukee Road Yard. It's a circus style ramp, just um, big um, B and B um, timbers and a gravel mm -hmm. ramp. And they run them down and chain them up. <clears throat> they also they have a second ramp, which is an old flat car, old Milwaukee Road flat car. 
Uh, these are Case New Holland and Case IH or CNH um, tractors. They're the same tractor basically, just some are blue, some are red. Um, implements also travel by rail. Here's a bunch of New Holland balers about to be unloaded on a team track in Burlington, Wisconsin. Those were made in Pennsylvania. And here's some early uh, Massey Harris combines. The original combines were so small that they were um, actually put in, shipped in boxes. Uh, this is, I think, about 1948. This one is temporarily delayed. <laughs> But now combines are so huge, one combine will fill the entire car. Sometimes you'll see two combine machines on a flat, and then you'll see the heads on a second flat. Or, or the, um, the tires are so wide, you'll see the tires on another flat. <laughs> it's not just brand new equipment that is shipped by rail. Here we see used equipment. Um, it's loaded on the team track and again, the CP, Cert Event, Wisconsin. These scrapers and um, off-road dump trucks are headed to a job on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. However, it's, the, it's too prohibitive to get the permits and pay all the fees to take these to Pennsylvania by truck. So they were loaded here by rail. So notice the machine is rusty, the tires are dirty, uh, the window has a piece of plywood to, for covering. Um, and the person who loaded it doesn't load it according to the official rules. They use every chain on that car. <laughs> is that nobody, they didn't want any mistakes. <laughs> right. That's what we call redundancy. Yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, here's a load coming out of the International Harvester Plant in Libertyville, Illinois, on the Milwaukee Road. My hometown. Oh, great. Yeah, so you're familiar, familiar with the Huff Corporation. Yeah. They invented the payloader. And you see in that picture probably the 25, 30-year evolution in sizes of payloaders um, that occurred during the 40s to, the to about 1960. And then here's my model of it. I used um, Berkshire Valley um, Easy Line and I twisted it before I glued it to the stake pockets with super glue. Yeah. And that's a wicking model. I made um, payloader decals on a photocopy machine and um, printed them out on clear photocopy on clear decal film and then applied it to this model. Okay, in the next section, chapter three is cranes, shovels, and hoists. Again, there's a loading diagram for everything. Here's a big P&H crane being unloaded in Michigan coming off the car ferry. Uh, this, was, this probably came um, through either Manitowoc or um, Green Bay. Here's the loading. Uh, if you're in one of the larger scales, you can actually use scale lumber to recreate each of these um, pieces of blocking. And then here's my model. <clears throat> There's always lots of neat photos that you can see of open loads. Here we are at the Bucyrus Erie plant in about 1944-45 with a giant um, dragline bucket. Mm. Um, through the Historical Construction Equipment Association, I met the vice president of shovel engineering at Bucyrus, and he provided a whole bunch of company photos to me um, showing the loads leaving the plant. <clears throat> Some of these machines were so big that they would take 150, 200, 300 flat car loads of machinery, and it would take two years to build the shovel at the mine. So Bucyrus took a photo of every single load before it left the plant, because 
you know, that you're at the assembly site at the mine and you think, did we ship that piece? <laughs> did that one get loaded? Where is that? So they kept track of every load they, sh they shipped out. Here's a neat color shot showing uh, four dragline buckets and a uh, last hole drill leaving the plant in South Milwaukee. This is uh, early 60s. So here's my model showing the same thing. On my posing board, I set up a little a little um, yard just like at they have at Bucyrus and took photos. Yeah. Bucyrus also had a plant out in Othello, Idaho. And here's one of the those loads, a big bucket and a couple um, boom sheaves to fill out the load. Notice how it's got uh, rods with uh, threaded rods with plates at the end. And then when it gets to its destination, those are cut off with a torch. Here's a boom on a trailer train flat in the 70s, leaving the plant. Lots of wooden blocking and uh, very just a few tie downs. Here's what a modern load looks like when it leaves the plant. This is a 495 HR shovel. This is the um, truck frame center. Um, this is what the, the shovel rotates on and the tracks go on the side, sides of it. It's loaded in um, upright position uh, with threaded rods and um, they don't use cables. It's all steel rods. Those steel rods are threaded on the ends and then they weld them together uh, or they're bolted onto plates. And this holds these together. Um, these flat cars are in dedicated service. Those um, pieces of um, steel welded to the deck are, um, are there perm or semi-permanently. When the flat car is unloaded in Alberta, um, the flat car comes back empty and then they load the next one. This was one of 12 shovels that were being shipped over a two-year period. Bucyrus has their own in-plant switcher. <clears throat> this is a part of a drag line being switched out over to the interchange with what's now the Union Pacific. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about chapter four, vessels, transformers, and oversized loads. So um, fracking heat exchangers, um, generators, all kinds of tanks and big things travel on depressed center flat cars or multiple load flat cars. <clears throat> Here's a load of, these are um, transformers that came from Austria and they're headed to Iowa. They're, being un they're unloaded here at the port of Milwaukee. It was part of a big wind energy program. Uh, West Dallas, Wisconsin is the location of the Bucyrus Erie, or no, I'm sorry, the Alice Chalmers, or was the location of Alice Chalmers. They made huge um, cement kilns there. And these cement kilns, because of the abrasion of the stone, only last maybe two years before they have to be replaced. So these were constantly being shipped out on the Milwaukee Road. <clears throat> Here we are in Schenectady, New York. And that's a rebuilt, um, I want to spacing on the name of that, the um, <clears throat> turbine. But look at all that blocking. Yeah, That's a lot of oak. Uh, and here we are with space shuttle parts. Those are the uh, solid rocket booster uh, frames that are, were drop forged at Laddish in Cudahy, Wisconsin. And they go by rail to Utah where they're turned into rockets. Uh, 
Uh, this is another Al Kambach photograph taken in the 50s of an Alice Chalmers um, transformer. Uh, this one was a bit of a mystery to me for a while until I realized uh, the mystery was why did they use wood to block this in place? I mean, you can see the steel um, bars in there, um, but why so much wood? But then I remembered in the early, 1951 was a time of a steel shortage. So they used wood instead. Here's a big Alice Chalmers circuit breaker on a Pennsylvania flat car being interchanged on the EJ&E back in about 1962. Um, what's interesting is you can actually buy this load. There's a company that 3D prints this. Um, it's the exact load. And I've got one sitting over on my desk. I just need to load it up on my flat car. So notice how the um, insulators are all covered in heavy paper and taped up. This is a neat view um, inside the Alice Chalmers plant. This is the transformer building. And the plant switcher is uh, pulling a load out of there. Um, the Alice Chalmers plant had 22 miles of in-plant trackage hmm. and six switching locomotives. Here's another big uh, load on a depressed center flat. And notice the radiators are stacked on the high part of the flats. More cooling equipment and insulators, part of a big load. I only included one photo here, but this was a series of um, a whole um, substation being shipped. And these, lo these um, loads are designed to go by rail, so they max out on the size of um, the clearance. So depressed center flat cars are often used. There's a lot of uh, steel and copper and metal in here, but they ship them without the oil. So they're not so heavy. This was a shot taken up in Calgary, Alberta. This is going to um, a refinery. So notice it's got a big, big custom-made saddles that hold the load on the upper level, but it's on a four-truck flat car because it's a heavy load. And here is, this is from the um, FRA inspector. We're still trying to figure out what this is. <laughs> Someone <laughs> said it might be a two pressure vessel, um, but that's the closest we've come to figuring out what it is. So this is something he had to inspect, but it's big and it looks heavy. It's taller than the locomotives. And then uh, BNSF and Union Pacific all, uh, and CP run special wind um, turbine trains where the whole train is gets special handling. And here we see a nice view of one of those. Okay, chapter five, buses, trucks, autos, and other vehicle loads. If you look closely at the view of the railway express trucks loaded there, uh, I chose that photo because you can see the pieces of wood are still stuck in the wire where, and you can see where the workers <clears throat> twisted that wire to um, <clears throat> tighten up the load. Before pneumatic tires, there were solid tires and those had to be loaded a special way. Um, there were wood block was, blocking was placed all around the tire and then um, either a wire or either a steel rod or a piece of wood was put through the spokes between the spokes and then nailed down to the deck of the flat. <clears throat> Here's a view at Racine Junction showing some of those um, wagons loaded up and how those wheels are blocked. This is, I think of this photo, this is kind of like the, the tri-level auto rack of its day back in 1900. <laughs> Here's more of those wagons. Uh, 
Automobiles also traveled in boxes. This is a, a, going to be a whole train load of automobiles heading for Australia. They're being loaded here at the Nash plant in Kenosha. The, um, the engines, frames, and the body are in that box, but the wheels are taken off. It's all broken down. And then the interiors will be assembled in Australia. Hmm. There's a um, oil cloth tarp over the top of the box. And that's to protect it from the elements while crossing the ocean. This is in Milwaukee, a brand new trolley bus being delivered at the company team track. Again, it's um, got one blocking around the wheels. Here's a view about 75 years later in Edmonton, Alberta, showing uh, another trolley bus this time on a trailer train flat, chained down and blocking around the wheels. Notice how it's riding really low. That's because this is an air ride bus. It's got air suspension and they bleed out the air before they ship it. <clears throat> and an open load, uh, two level rack of minivans leaving Ontario. Heavy equipment also rides on flat cars. Notice again, wired down and lots of wood blocking. Here's a modern cat dump truck. This one's headed to Spain. Our, uh, my, my friend, the FRA inspector flagged this one because the blocking shifted and the blocking is in it, uh, inadequate. <laughs> So this one had to be um, fixed up by the car men before it could proceed. Notice the dump truck is so wide, it hangs over the side of the car. Mm -hmm. Narrow gauge locomotives uh, also travel on flats. A lot of, lot of tie downs, there's some snubbers in there to absorb um, impact and a lot of heavy oak blocking. <clears throat> the trucks, these are narrow, this is a, um, an export locomotive, and the trucks are on another flat car. <clears throat> Airplane bodies also travel by rail on special flat cars from Wichita up to Washington State. Okay, let's talk about forest products and building materials <clears throat> from logs to lumber. It all moves on flat cars. But here's a modern um, stake side flat car. All welded construction, heavy stakes, but there's also um, a cable holding the logs together on the flat. Here's how lumber was shipped for about a hundred years until the center beam cars came along or the bulkhead flat cars also. Um, each bundle is banded together and then the bundles are banded to each other. Stakes are put on the sides and on the top and then there's um, boards along the top and the whole thing is um, banded together. These loads, uh, if they take a lot of shock, um, they tend to shift. Um, the Union Pacific and other railroads had actual reload centers where they would have to reload flat cars that, of lumber that were on the transcontinental journey. <clears throat> Here's a bulkhead load that shifted. Uh, notice that switchman isn't getting too close <laughs> as they set this car out. <laughs> Um, my friend, I had another friend who was a conductor. He had a picture of a center beam at this same yard that was completely flipped over. Mm. Uh, pulpwood also goes by a gondola. One of the alternative ways to ship it is to um, put wire mesh all around the load to keep the logs from falling out. And here's a picture of that. 
it's usually not modeled and it's usually hard to see in photographs. Notice they use saplings for side stakes on the end and sides to hold that load in. Here's a load of creosote, creosoted poles um, coming out of Florida. Uh, notice that load is a bit greasy and it slid to one end of the car. <laughs> totally slipped that cradle of um, sapling trees. Gonna pop a wheelie. Yeah. <clears throat> But here's how creosoted poles are shipped today. There's um, polyester banding. It's not the nylon banding, it's polyester. And if you go on the internet and look up polyester shipping banding, you can go down the rabbit hole and read all about it. <clears throat> nylon degrades too quickly, so it has to be polyester and it has to be DOT certified and everything. So um, it's interesting to see that these the bands are yellow or another color, depending um, on their specifications. But also notice how they put the buttons at the end and then the tips, a little thinner, are um, stacked in the middle. <clears throat> Stumpwood also goes by rail to um, turpentine refineries. Gypsum board. This is the way that um, it was shipped in the 60s. Wrapped up in tarps that were that said US gypsum on the side. And then there's some open loads that defy all categorization. This was a giant boulder that was found in Minneapolis when they were building the uh, the Metro Dome or the Superdome, whatever they call it up there. And some bank executive said, you know, I like that rock. It would look perfect on the lawn of the new bank office building I'm building. So they somehow picked this thing up, put it on this flat car. They're using tractor tires to um, brace it and cables. And they moved it a short distance on the Sioux line and then unloaded it. And a friend of mine says that this rock is still there in front of that bank. Yeah. It hasn't gone anywhere. I don't think it will. No. Yeah, it's going to take a glacier to move that thing. I say the, the yeah. bank building might go down before the rock does. Yeah. Absolutely. Look at, look at all the oh. trucks on that car. Yeah. Yeah, those are six wheel trucks, and there's four of them. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, chapter seven military equipment. Um, it all moves by rail. Um, there's a bunch of brand new Oshkosh trucks coming down uh, from Oshkosh back in the 90s. And then below, that's a load of um, tank destroyers at the Massey Harris plant that are going to be rebuilt from M10 to M36 back in about 1944. And there, this is a publicity photo of the guy pointing to it while the photographer takes a picture. <clears throat> You can go online and read the tie-down instructions for rail movements. These are not secrets. They're wide open. And um, you can read all about it if you have a modern military load and you want to tie it down, either on a trailer train or a Department of Defense flat car. So these manuals are used not only by um, National Guard or the Army, but they're also used by manufacturers or people who are buying the equipment for scrap or exporters or whoever needs to ship something by rail can use these specifications. Okay, then the last chapter is maintenance of way and railroad service. So um, open loads are also found when they're building or maintaining the railroad. <laughs> So there's a, in the upper left is a tie crane um, unloading ties on the Chicago Northwestern. There's a brand new welded boiler headed to the Milwaukee Road shops to put together a um, 484 Northern. And then the lower right shows a picture of um, a cinder gone. Again, the Canadian National has lots of customized cars. 
Here's one used in maintenance of way service. It's painted orange. This carries 78 foot rails. Hmm. And there's there's no tie down needed. The those um, side stakes are welded in and the rails are just loaded in by the crane and that's it. <clears throat> The Union Pacific probably has some of the coolest maintenance trains out there. This is the Thai Gang um, train. The way it works is they have all the train is in two parts. The back half of the train is all the pneumatic wheeled vehicles. The front half of the train is all the on track um, maintenance equipment. And then the middle is um, tank cars full of diesel fuel and tank cars full of scrap and plates and whatever they're using. So it's unloaded from both ends circus style. The on-track machinery goes down a ramp that goes right onto the rails and the back half of the train is unloaded at a uh, grade crossing. And these cars are all, all have ramps between them and it would make a heck of a neat train if somebody wanted to do that. Uh, you can set the era of your, um, of your layout by whether it's steam diesel or steam being scrapped or streetcars being scrapped. Um, here's a sad shot of one of those Milwaukee Road Northerns um, heading to scrap in Chicago. <laughs> so if you have one of those old Bachman locomotives from the 70s and you don't know what to do with it, there you go. <laughs> uh, open loads are also the hospital train cleaning up wrecks here's a view i shot up in alberta of a wreck cleanup notice this hopper has had the side smashed in cut into it with a bulldozer to get the grain out of it so they could lift it up and then load it in the gondola and send it away to be cut up Old locomotives meet the same fate. Here we are in the Milwaukee Valley with a bunch of, with Milwaukee Road F7 and um, a chopped up Fairbanks Morse locomotive. Well, here, that's actually me a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> up, up close and personal with the open loads working in maintenance of way. So um, thank you for listening. I hope you got something out of this. I hope you enjoyed it. If you know of any other groups who would like um, to see this presentation, please um, email me their, their name and contact information. And um, I'd be happy to talk to them too. The book is still available, but they are telling me it's almost sold out. Yeah. Those of you who bought it, thank you. I hope you really enjoy it and have as much fun with it as I did. Uh, putting it together. Excellent. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. That's, that's you. a great presentation. <laughs> really enjoyed it. And uh, we've got Dan from the Twin Cities Division. They may they may want to uh, take you up on your offer. So uh, sure. many of us are in that Zoom group you mentioned, uh, and Ron would be here today, except that he's having a family day um, with us, uh, with his family uh, celebrating Easter. So he Super. sends his regards. But uh, yeah, that was great. I uh, really enjoyed it. We had a few people on Facebook as well, watching it on Facebook Live. Now, Keith, uh, do you mind if I post the recording of this on YouTube? Yeah, I think it'd be okay. Okay, great. Um, we had, we organized those Thursday Zooms as well, and we've got quite a collection of, of um, clinics on our YouTube page, and which is becoming popular. And so... Maybe that sells a few more books, although it sounds like that's not not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Just about sold out. Any any yeah. chance of a second printing? Oh, uh, that's not, that's not up to me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's not my thing. But I have enough material to probably do another whole book. Oh wow, that's great. so much that had to be left out. Um, it was just incredible all the great stuff that, yeah it sounded like you really got uh great access to uh, a variety of collections so in a variety of eras too which is neat yeah. uh i think that it's that's always such a popular 
topic is the open loads and a lot of guys love modeling that so i i can see why the book's been so popular so congratulations on that oh thank you yeah it's really hard to find those old open load photos of old um spoke wheeled vehicles or just the old stuff it's yeah so i was glad i was lucky yeah i modeled the uh the early 60s in the upper peninsula in all the ore and I've been trying to figure out what uh, what kind of earth movers they would have been using in the taconite uh, mines where they were doing surface mining. So I, I wrote down the info for that uh, Historical Construction Equipment Association. I think that's going to be the ticket. Yeah, they probably use either Caterpillar or Euclid um, dump trucks. Uh -huh. Some pictures I've seen of Bucyrus in the taconite <laughs> the, in the Iron Range um that's what they're loading okay or mac mac mm -hmm. heavy duty off-road dump trucks that's what they'd be loading yeah. cool yeah. well i appreciate it and uh thank you again for being willing to present for us it was really enjoyable <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you all right yeah. if anybody has questions i'll take them I have a question. Have you ever seen or heard how in a post battlefield, how they clean up battlefields, a bent, you know, destroyed tanks? And has that ever been documented by anybody? I'm, I'm sure it has. I ran into a bunch of photos of tanks going to scrap. Um, I've seen lots of photos Europe taken in Europe of um cleaning up battlefield like just scrap tanks and like the ukraine war the ukraine war has generated so much scrap metal and the mm -hmm. um the iraq war they blew up everything along a highway and the yeah that first one i've just never seen how they ever clean up battlefields and whether or not railroads are involved in that oh yeah i'm sure they're moving all the all the scrap metal to in like modern era today, a lot of that scrap goes to India and where it's cut up. Um, how, did, how do they get it to India? Do they take it to a port and then ship yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, right. Hmm. Yeah, there's ships that are specially designed for hauling scrap steel. Thank you. My, yeah, my, sure. my only question is probably pretty simple. Um, how do they fasten down all the wood blocking? I mean, must use some really big spikes or something. Yeah, yeah the loading diagram tells what size spike. <clears throat> okay. These, these, are, these nails look like they're about 12 inches long. And I'm looking at those stacks, you know, when they stack up those oak beams on top of each other, mm -hmm. they got to fasten the uh, one beam into another beam into another beam and i think that would be kind of unstable i think but, they use um threaded steel rods oh okay and they drill, drill through all the all the blocking and then oh, yeah. then the rod goes all the way through the bottom of the car uh -huh. it's screwed into the bottom of the car well that makes sense i've never never seen it up close never done it so i was just kind of wondering about that yeah, I think that's how they'd have to do it. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of times the loads are um, secured right through the deck of the car. Either welded to the deck of the car or welded to the stake pockets, or they have bolts, the threaded rods going right, they drill right through the, the car. Right. And that's why they went to the OTTX tie downs because the decks don't get so damaged yeah and the get... decks could only hold up for so long you'd think yeah yeah they don't get so many nails or drill holes and then um if you go on um, some of the websites for some of the heavy duty flat cars they have instructions for shippers telling them that this is where you can drill a hole in the car this is where you can't and um then they i think it's casgro rail had a big section on on the, their cars are red their slogan is red and ready but the the curved part of the depressed center flat cars is painted white and they have a big stencil that says do not weld or drill in this area 
And then on the website, they say, if you weld or drill in that area, you're going to pay for the repair because that, that weakens the structural strength of that car to cut into those areas. Yeah. So sometimes I see models that are loaded where the tie downs go into the no-no areas, <laughs> but that's, that's just the way it is. You know, yeah. you load your stuff the way you want to. The model, you can get away with it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Any other questions or comments? Or I also take um, suggestions for how to improve this. <laughs> if anybody's got them. <clears throat> I, think, I think it was great. Thanks okay. again, Keith. Really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to I've I've got a copy of the book. I haven't read it carefully yet, so I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Uh, and uh, and maybe there'll be a volume two. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, thanks everybody for attending. Thanks again, Keith, for presenting. And uh, we'll put this out on YouTube and probably get a lot of traffic there too. So uh, everybody have a great Easter and we'll uh, see you see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, we'll talk to you guys later. <laughs>